<laughs> so I am a pilot, low time. I don't do all the uh, adventuresome stuff that Jim does. But they had a 182 that I could fly. And so um, went up with the 182 on a real pretty day. Uh, no wave, no clouds, you know, it was calm. My kind of day. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, girlfriend. Yes. <laughs> all right. So um, th this is the airport here. And, and that truly is that milky turquoise that I was uh, talking about. Um, and they tow to this area is, is where they, they normally start to climb. But um, nice wide runway. Notice tire tracks are only on this end. Mm -hmm. They almost never <laughs> use that end of the runway. It's there. Um, and it, there's not a, a full length taxiway. So here's the hangar that we um, uh, put, put the purlin in. The, it, it's a very large hangar, you know, like this 85 foot wingspan, and we pull it out here to here to here, and then you have to back taxi. So you have to insert yourself between airline operations, try to not impact, we're trying to be good citizens and good of the airport, and try not to impact at all any of the, the commercial airlines that are coming in. So besides seeing <clears throat> pretty animals and stuff. I actually do have a, a role with the with, uh, uh, Perlin Group. I've, I've done, um, managed the logistics for 10 international campaigns. And so I've gone through customs, various different places, and arranged shipping, and, and all the other stuff that's involved. Um, let me just say that going to Argentina, things take three times longer than you possibly thought they could, you know, ever do. You don't double, you triple your time. And uh, you take to El Calafate absolutely everything you need. There is no Amazon Prime. There is no Home Depot. There is no aircraft spruce. There, there's nothing, okay? You take it with you. Now, repair stuff. They're really good at welding and that kind of thing. But to actually go out and purchase something is extremely difficult. Um, so we have a 40-foot standard container. And we're going to put the trailer on this side of it. Um, and we have 14 inches to play with here for our stacking shelves. And then, of course, we're going to pull these shelves out and put them in the hangar so that we can be organized with our storage once we get to the hang hangar. Um, and then uh, Greg Skates uh, put a really heavy-duty um, uh, steel shelf up there so we could put more of our big things because <coughs> I got more room at, at the front of the trailer than along the side of the container. So we push the trailer in and we load the container on a truck at midnight and the truck goes to Long Beach and it goes on a boat and the boat, the first boat goes to Mexico and then it shifts to a different boat, it's called a transshipment. The second boat is much slower. It's going to stop lots of places in Central America, and here, and here, and here, and here, and finally get down to Santiago, Chile area. Okay, uh, either Valparaiso or San Antonio are the ports that are on the Pacific there. Um, so we offload it there. It's still under custom seal. It is put on a truck, and it comes through the Andes Mountains. And that doesn't sound like much. I mean, come on, it's July. What's the problem? Well, we're usually waiting out winter blizzards in the Andes in July, and we wait until the roads are clear and safe for a truck to come through these um, uh, tunnels. So there's tunnels that go through there. Um, once it gets to Mendoza, which, by the way, you can put that on your bucket list while you're there. <laughs> lovely town. Uh, kind of like the Napa of South America. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. Um, and it clears customs there. So it's been sealed up until that point. Um, Chile and Argentina share a very long border. And they don't get along very well. Oh, and so well. clearing customs is a big deal. If you're driving, like with a rental car, going back and forth, you can absolutely count on it being an hour, if not longer, to clear customs. Anyway, so we are customs sealed through there. And we don't <coughs> unseal for customs. Uh, Mendoza is called a dry dock. 
and so we <coughs> are still get paid there. Um, we ha have a lovely broker, been using him six years, six different trips in Argentina, and he knows how to um, take care of you know all these crazy uh, requirements. There's requirements for insurance, requirements for a letter of invitation. You need to be invited to come fly in Argentina. Okay. And, and all the other stuff you need. Um, now, from there to there is shorter than from here to here to here to here. Except the shorter distance is not paved. Not completely. And the roads are, in the winter time, either muddy or impassable or, at the very least, washboarded and cobblestony and just will shake the living daylights out of your container. So we don't go there. We come all the way around. And once it gets to El Calafate, we got to take it off of that truck. And we open the container, or the, the trailer, and inspect it really close, because we're hoping we do not see damage, which we, we were fine last year. The team takes, um, it takes usually about 15 people to support two to go out in the glider. It's very, very intensive as far as work, and it's specialized. I mean, you just don't hire somebody off the street to come help you because it's just really easy to hurt something that if you didn't bring a spare for it, it'll shut you down. I mean, if you broke something that is, you know, uh, that you need and it's not there that you can find and you can't repair it, you, your campaign is finished for the day. So these folks are great people. They're from around the world as far as um, different nationalities, predominantly American, I will say, but uh, from all around. And it's not the best <coughs> photo of the sky, because we were lightening it up to get pictures of the people. But I've I got to give you a photo of a better one than the sky put in here. Right here are these really light white clouds. Those are very, very high altitude. And they are pearlescent in color. They're extremely high out. And I'm not a meteorologist, so I won't go into too much there. The Scandinavian word for pearl is perla. Oh. And Einar Ivoltsen has a Scandinavian history background. So the name of the Perlin project is Pearl from our namesake clouds. And, and those clouds are about 100,000. I think that's kind of where they are, but don't quote me on that because I'm not a meteorologist. So we were excited this one morning, they were getting ready to fly, and before dawn we were seeing these high, high, high altitude clouds light up because the sun was there, it just wasn't down where we were. So that, that's one of the reasons to have this picture. We always try to motivate and inspire youngsters. Um, I personally taught mostly in the high school uh, age, and if they're not wanting to learn math and science in the American high school time frame, teenagers. They will not be successful in college because colleges assume they have a foundation in math and science. And if they aren't successful there, then they cannot become engineers. And we need more people like what you all represent. <coughs> we need them young. And so we take our project to whatever children we can, whether it's here in the U.S., down in Argentina, we've done it in Mendoza, Buenos Aires, we try to motivate kids. Now, we also work with some universities, but we're really trying to focus and catch them younger and inspire them. These kids were awesome. Okay, we did two different um, uh, auditoriums full of kids. They, they, you know, bust them to the auditorium and Absolutely. They were as well-mannered as this group is right here. They ask as good a questions as you all asked before Jim started his official talk. And I was a little worried when we started passing around the helmets. Remember, if you don't bring it with you as a spare, you don't have another one. If something happened to Miguel's helmet, well, we had one spare, but we'd have to kind of, um, you know, kind of work it up together. But anyway. Um, but Miguel insisted on getting it passed around, and those kids held it reverently. Okay, yes, they wouldn't put it on, but it was never tossed or thrown, you know, or anything like that. They were great kids. 
Um, it's winter down there, so uh, we have uh, ten little cabins that um, I, I, I found, <laughs> and I told Tago, because my Spanish is incredibly poor, and, um, but Tago has worked with us for years, and I said, Tago, because I found it on TripAdvisor, I said, that, those cabins right there, you go talk to whoever owns those cabins, we want to rent all ten cabins for two months. And um, so Tago went down there and, and uh, talked to Eduardo, and that's what we did. So, so this, it, it's kind of like a little resort, but it's right in town, so it's, you know, not resort-ish. Um, so we all kind of stay in the same area. When we had enough snowfall, uh, one of our intern, Alec, uh, his college intern, uh, had to make a, a snowman and put a purlin jacket on it, you know, do that. Of course, if it was snowing in town, it was also snowing at the airport, so we had to get some stuff uh, plowed there. So, with that, uh, we're going to go back to the technical details. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. So, we've been there eight weeks, and we hadn't had good weather. And we're starting to worry that, well, maybe we're not going to have good weather, but September 3rd rolled around. And uh, we had a fantastic day. I'm going to have to click on it with okay. the mouse. Do I need to turn the volume <coughs> on so no, they no, can hear that? Okay, I can it's supposed to be automatic. But no, uh -uh. it didn't play. <coughs> there, now hit. hit this one? Yep. Oh, it's going to have to buffer. This is a little video that Airbus built. So, roll the airplane out of the hangar. You get to talk and, with uh, it. We normally uh, crawl in, do a pressurization check, depressurize for takeoff, tow off. Release from tow. Typically, we're about. 10,500 or so when we get off the tow, it's just because it's 30 miles upwind. What's the tow plane? Um, two years ago we had a Pawnee, a two-seat Pawnee, and this past year we used a Boero, which is an Argentine copy of a Super Cub, 180 horse Super Cub. what was it like at high altitude and well there was some elation because we'd achieved our goal. You know we've been working on this 11 years and to accomplish the goal was a fantastic feeling. And of course there's a sense of relief. Yes we actually can do this. Yeah. So it, it, was, it was really great. Okay. I think this is going to work. Yeah. This is a graphic that the meteorologist made for us. So it's across the line from uh, west of the Andes to out in the Pampa. And basically, it shows in orange or red areas where the air is rising due to mountain wave. And then in blue is areas where it's sinking. And you can see that there's pretty good lift up to about 30,000 feet. And then there's a zone where the lift is not good. And then once you get up in the stratosphere, the lift picks up and allows us to climb higher. And we stopped our climb at 52,172 on the GPS. It was flight level 540 on the altimeter. The difference in the two being the non-standard nature of the atmosphere. Up until about 10 years ago, the FAI, who does records, used pressure altitude. But they realized as soon as you get above 50,000 feet, the errors in the standard atmosphere become more significant. So. With the advent of GPS, they switched the records over to GPS altitudes. And uh, in this case, GPS altitude is much lower than the pressure altitude. This says that uh, we could have probably climbed to 70,000 feet given the conditions on that wow. particular day. But uh, we're doing a flight test like you do at Mojave or Edwards, and we're doing a build up 
our test points up to this point, we had done test points up to 35,000 feet, and so we're doing points over 5,000 feet. And uh, we set up our test card here so he'd go high enough to uh, break a record, but, uh, but not go higher without analyzing our data. The flutter data that we're gathering, you know, basically when we're doing a flutter point, we're able to run the flutter system from the cockpit. We typically do a 30 second sweep of data. Those data are recorded. We can telemeter them to the ground. The folks on the ground then email a file to San Diego, and the folks in San Diego have software where they can analyze it. You know, this day we worked our way up above uh, 50,000 feet. And uh, the other thing is, right before takeoff, when we did our flight briefing, you know, you set your limits for the day. We had set 35% battery power as our minimum for coming home. When we passed 52,000 feet, we had 36%. So we had, it turns out now that we've been there and we have good data, we can actually go to 24% and still have plenty of battery for our recovery. Plus, we're adding more battery this winter, so, yes. so next year we can fly longer. This is a graphic of the route of the flight. So we took off from El Calafate here. Um, you tow into the wind, and the nearest location of wave tends to be downwind of Cerro Buenos Aires right here. And uh, we got off tow and climbed to about 28,000 feet where the lift really uh, tapered off. It was getting very weak. So we decided to go forward to a location that our forecast said potentially had uh, wave again. Plus there was a high altitude cloud that uh, was a lenticular. So it took a 7,000 feet of altitude to move forward to this location. And uh, sure enough, we found good, good real strong lift to about 30,000 feet. Then it tapered off again. We did a bunch of test points, which is why lots of uh, zigzags here. And I'm looking at the clouds, the top of the clouds to the south were smoother than the clouds that were underneath us. Typically that means that the flow is more laminar, and if the flow is more laminar and stable, it means that the wave might be better. So we decided to go south and try down here, and it was better there. Our forecast said that as we got higher, we wanted to go downwind a little bit, and then this is where we did our zigzags uh, up to uh, flight level 540. How long was the flight? 6.6 .6 hours. It took us five and a half hours to get to altitude. Now, if we repeated the flight, We'd probably get to altitude an hour sooner because we weren't, wouldn't have to do the test points again. And uh, we might go south a little faster. Can you open up that 5,000 foot test band as you go higher so you don't have to do so much testing as you go higher? Or 10,000 feet, 8,000 feet? That's a good question. Um, we know that as we get higher, the Dutch roll damping is going to uh, go down. So 5,000 is probably going to be a good number for us. This is... A picture taken of the rear instrument panel um, up at uh, 53,000 feet. Um, this is a tail camera display. Mm -hmm. So I was flying the Morgan Centercock, and he's able to see that display. Um, this is our moving map display. It's a standard LX9000 light computer, which has been modified for high altitude, so it records our altitude up to above 100,000 feet if we ever got up that high. And uh, we got an attitude indicator built into it. So we have a uh, you know, emergency system for flying in clouds. We don't intend to fly in clouds. And typically when you get high, there aren't any clouds. This is what we call our life support systems display. Their plane is probably the most instrumented cell plane ever. We've got like 19 Arduinos, which are little computers that talk to each other. They're on a 485 bus, and we're trying to record all kinds of temperatures in the cabin, in the instrument bay. Um, you know, we're recording pressures of the air and the oxygen and oxygen percentages and carbon dioxide percentages and flutter data. And all of that stuff that's on the 485 bus is actually being telemetered to the ground. So the folks on the ground can see exactly uh, what's going on in the airplane. Which, of course, as a crew, gives you additional crew members, essentially, that can uh, look at parameters that uh, tell you whether you're uh, in... You know, something's going out of the uh, black and something might be come unsafe. This is a picture from the front cockpit. And uh, see the frost on the cabin? Oh. You know, the, the outside air at this altitude is probably, oh, minus 80F roughly. And in the cabin, we're wearing uh, a special wave flying suit. It's really a ski suit. Um, I had on a electric vest 
electric pant liners and electric insoles in my boots. The only thing I used was electric insoles. You know, my experience has been if you keep your feet warm in a cell plane, the rest of you can kind of keep warm. But, but the suit was enough to keep the upper body uh, warm. Let's see. This window here is down sun. This window I couldn't scrape the frost off. This, this window here you can see a little bit of frost behind it, but uh, basically you're flying looking out this little straw on the right hand side and the side window here. It's like, wow. Where are the handles? The handles for? You had the orange and the yellow. The orange. Um, the, up there, one is for the um, release from tow, and the other one is to jettison the drug chute that's in the tail. The so this, this is a release from tow, this is to jettison the drug chute if you ever used it. The builder's signatures inside and around the port uh, window there? <coughs> what, right here? Yeah. Now they're under the seat pan, but uh, oh, and right there, if you sorry. look real close, there's a little thing I had memorized, but 15,610 meters is the altitude we had to reach to break a record. It used to be you had to beat an altitude record by 3%. When they went to GPS, because GPS accuracy is kind of consistent everywhere, they changed it to 150 meters. So the old record was 15,460, you had 150, that's uh, 1510. And right here I've got 15,890, so we knew we had 300 meters of uh, extra altitude to uh, find the record. And we peaked out at uh, flight level 540 and uh, came on down. This is a trace of our altitude versus time. So take off, we're on tow, we flew through some sink. We got off, tow right about here, 10,500 feet. The lift down low really wasn't that strong. And it took us, what, over an hour to get up to here. And we did uh, move forward, lost our 7,000 feet. The lift was stronger, did a bunch of test points. And then when we moved, we found the lift and worked our way up to uh, flight level 540. We're averaging about 300 feet a minute when we uh, stopped our climb. And uh, coming down is always easy. Gravity always wins. <laughs> This is a picture of the telemetry room on the ground. So in one of the offices in the hangar, we'd set up uh, some weather computers. So here's the weather forecast. And then the telemetry data are being displayed on these computers here. There's a picture from uh, 52,000 feet. You know, the sky's starting to get dark and you start to see the curvature of the earth. That's one of my favorites here because it's got kind of the sun in the corner. Nice dark sky. Black sky. And the heavy crew after landing. <laughs> like the picture real close. There's one thing wrong. Our only problem with the whole flight, really. The main wheel is flat. Oh. Uh, apparently, in the cold, the valve stem wasn't tight enough, and it leaked out. The air leaked oh. out because, um, fortunately. As Jackie mentioned, we tried to work with air traffic control so we didn't interfere with the airliners. So we could have actually landed sooner, but we waited until after the last airliner departed. And uh, yeah, we landed and the tire was flat, but uh, you know, the locals weren't concerned because there's no other traffic coming. And we just put air in it and uh, it's held air ever since. Oh. We tightened it up a little bit and got a different valve cap. But, uh, you know, we look at it this way a flat tire, if that's the worst thing that happens, it was a pretty good flight. <laughs> and the heavy ground crew back at the hangar. As I mentioned, we're trying to do some science along <coughs> with the exploration. We have an ozone meter on the airplane, and until this flight, we hadn't gotten above the tropopause. And if you're below the tropopause, the ozone recording is always pretty close to zero. In fact, we were kind of worried, well, maybe this thing ain't working. Yeah. <laughs> But get to the trouble pause, and above the trouble pause, as you climb, those zones going up and then back down. So uh, we got some ozone data for the scientists. What got, was the experiment the first graders had you take? Marshmallows. It was oh. awesome. It was oh. awesome. So they had marshmallows, and they wanted to know would they expand because their teacher had you know done a little science with them. <laughs> Or would it freeze first? 
And how do you think they were, how are first graders going to measure marshmallows? Mm -hmm. Dental floss. They wrapped like a belt around the middle of the marshmallow oh. to see if it would expand, you know, beyond the belt. Oh, it was awesome. It was a great experiment. We loved it. And we did not eat the marshmallows after it was done. I just want you to know. <laughs> so did they expand or did they freeze? Both. They expanded and then they froze. Yes. Okay, so, so you got some expansion, but not as much as one would think. And where was this first grade class? Was it? Ooh, that I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure. Because we had, we had a bunch of CubeSat experiments. So, and, and the high school kids were, you know, a little more upscale. Ten whiskers. And then there was something about growing moss in, in you know, limited oxygen environment. And so there were some neat you know, variety of experiments. Are these uh, schools that are in the U.S. or are they all down there? Um, U.S. and Puerto Rico at the beginning, because it's mm -hmm. a teachers in space um, right. kind of program, we're, we're making effort at trying to get one of these CubeSats, if not more, from um, Argentina itself. So there is... Very good. Yeah, there, there might be you know, might be yeah. want for 2018, there might be uh, Argentine keeps that. I love that. Yeah. I love it. yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. And it's really nice having Airbus on your team because yeah, their uh, PR system is very good. So, as of the end of October, they documented like 411 articles in magazines or TV shows and that sort of thing. And the circulation or views they estimate was like 1.4 billion. Wow. And each one of those, they say, is an impression. And then multiply it by some factor, so it's almost five billion impressions, so to speak, here from the event. See, I told you he was a rock star. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Air star. Air star, not rock. So the future. So the airplane actually is in Rosemont as we speak. Um, Greg Skates, one of our neighbors, is helping us do some composite upgrades or build a new battery box so we have more battery capacity. And... Uh, we're building some new hatches. The hatches we have don't fit perfectly. And, uh, we're going to do some flights in the Sierra. You know, the wave season is just starting. As I mentioned, yes, yeah, it's today. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah, and then, uh, there was some records set in February, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And then uh, July through September this year, we're going back to Argentina. We'll try it again. And, why, uh, why Argentina again? <coughs> missed why? The, the polar vortex only occurs in the polar regions. Um, it occurs in the northern hemisphere, but they say that the one in the northern hemisphere is about 40% uh, weaker than the southern hemisphere. And uh, I haven't seen a good reason, except my guess is Antarctica is a landmass, so it's, it's colder. And it's really driven by the surface gets very cold, so the air next to the surface gets very dense. It starts flowing towards the pole. Coriolis causes it to spin. And uh, you know, the Arctic is an ocean, so it doesn't get as cold. So that's why the difference in uh, strength. Because Argentina is the only landmass all the way around the Earth, the lower levels are warmer because mm -hmm. the ocean keeps them warmer. Um, to get into the polar vortex in the northern hemisphere, you need to go someplace like uh, Sweden, which over the land in Sweden in the wintertime gets to be extremely cold outside. Sure. In uh, El Calafate, typically in July when we got there, the temperature would vary between a few degrees below freezing to a few degrees above. So it is actually, you know, livable. Consistent. You could potentially do it over the Ural Mountains, but now you're talking, you know, like minus 40 in, uh, in you know, August. Not, not August, it'd be February there. So the hatch repair, is that to fix the leak rate that you have? Well, we want to make sure that we keep a low leak rate. Um, the seal that we've got on the hatch is satisfactory, but uh, since we have this opportunity to make it better. What about an unexpected decompression? Well, that, that's a risk. Um, the airplane is built to spacecraft standards, like Spaceship One, Spaceship Two. You know, they're not using pressure suits in those. So normally when you build an airplane, you use a safety factor of 50%. So if your wing is designed to 6Gs, that, that's your design, uh, then you build a 9G wing, so you got a 50% safety margin. 
Um, for space capsules, I use a 300% design limit. So we actually built a, a test fuselage. Our maximum expected pressurization is 8.5 psi. So we tested it to 25 psi. And the aft bulkhead failed just like it was supposed to. So, so the, the pressurization system got a safety factor of three. Um, well, we could tolerate a small leak, and we can get the air in fast enough to make up a small leak. We've got the drug chute to help us come down fast. We're breathing uh, on a rebreather system, 100% oxygen, so we're getting the nitrogen out of our body as much as possible, so you're less likely to get the And, then, you know, our windows, we have an outer window, which is bonded in, and we have an inner window, which is on a gasket, which is a safety window, so to speak. And it's, it's actually the same as the airliner window, the way it's designed to go in the airplane. What, what, do you do, what do you do with all of the data? I mean, like, when you're, what are you actually exploring besides weather and meteorology? Well, it's, it's mainly meteorology stuff. We're looking at the structure of the mountain wave and trying to get better models of the mountain wave. At very high altitude, there's a chance that phenomenon called breaking wave occurs and basically that's a sudden breakdown in the laminar flow of the wave mm -hmm. and that actually could cause lots of mixing between the troposphere and stratosphere which is not in any climate model right now so the data those data could help climate scientists build better models as they study the climate how many hours is your rebreather system good for um, the rebreather system basically has a hose that goes into a canister and they have a CO2 scrubber in it, so it's taking the CO2 out. Mm -hmm. The CO2 canister, they say, could go 19 hours. Um, oxygen, we've got a 77 cubic foot bottle, and we've been using about 25% of that on a, like a 6.6 .6 hour flight. The airplane's really designed to go 8 hours. Um, we got the 6.6 .6 hours. The reason we got low on the battery in part was the heaters for the flutter excitation. We ran those a lot on that flight as we climbed up. And uh, you know, the heaters draw a lot of current, so it uses up the power pretty quickly. So can you leave that off on the next flight and just turn them on at 52? Or Yes, or? exactly. Okay. So the flutter excitation you use as you climb to, to check? When we get to a integrity. particular test condition, yeah. we have to turn the heater on, warm them up, and then when they're warm, then we can run them. Yeah, we, normally run them for, we normally run them for uh, a 30 second sweep, and then it takes about five minutes for the data to go down our, telemetry is not super fast. Uh, so it takes about five minutes to download the data, and then it takes the folks in San Diego another five to ten minutes to run it through their software and give us a year and a. Uh, you didn't have a personal parachute then? No, like I said, we don't think we, if, if, especially the airplane's spinning, there's no way you could crawl out the hatch. Okay. You know, especially with your ski suit on and that sort of stuff. So you come down to VRS. Generally speaking, what kind of ride is it? Because I've only been in a glider once, but is it pretty pretty bumpy and do you have a lot of Gs or not so On this particular flight yes. here, when we're on tow, we flew through some turbulence. Um, and the worst it got, I would say, would be medium. Once we got off tow and we're climbing in the wave, perfectly smooth the whole rest of the day. Yeah, I can. 1.4 G, I think, was our highest G, and that was because we're turning at 45 degrees of bank. How long of time were you on tow? We towed 40 minutes on this flight. Oh, One day we spent 75 minutes on tow. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, so at the beginning, you spoke about a t shirt environment on the inside. Uh, do you think that's ever going to, you know, be possible to where you don't have to wear the, all the heated? Um, no, it won't be that warm. No. It, maybe if you had some electrical heating system, but then you'd have to have a huge battery, so it can weigh you down. Just more yeah, weight. Yeah. <laughs> but but as I said, I was comfortable. I was happy the whole time. My feet were warm, and, uh, and we were smiling hard. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike Aner, you know, when Aner when they did their record. They apparently were pushing frostbite. They were extremely cold. Uh, have, have you looked at a rack for power? It's been suggested um, to, to really 
we need a rat that might be, I don't know, 400 watts or so. And, you know, a ram air turbine, a little propeller that sticks out in the windstream, of course, that's drag, which means you can't climb as high. Now, on descent, when we're wanting to get down, you know, we could run the battery lower if you had a ram air turbine. Um, if somebody had one that had the, the right wattage, I'd be more than happy to talk to them. We've talked about, you know, a landing gear is fixed because we're flying slow, <clears throat> and the pressure bulkhead was in the way of retracting the gear. So at slow speed, the extra drag of having a fixed gear is not a problem. But I can envision, you know, a little tunnel inside the gear well where you run some air in it and get a little propeller inside that runs a generator, and maybe a door on the front so you could uh, close it off until you come down. That, that, would, uh, that would be the most excellent thing, but it adds more mass, it adds more complexity, and uh, it's going to cost something. So, can you start about tow through those optical windows? Do you stay high tow, low tow, off to the side, I assume? You took it offset a little bit, try, try to keep them pretty much in the center. Um, we haven't had to get off tow yet because we lost sight, but it, it's always a concern because. Oh. Because, you know, as I said, the windows are pretty far out and got a little... We are using a 300-foot rope, which helps because you can get a little farther out of position at the same angle and then come back into position. Any uh, noticeable visual differences in really high altitude lenticulars compared to, say, your classic Sierra ones? Uh... On, this, on this day, um, on the high flight, there were a few clouds down low. But uh, up where we were flying, totally clear. So, so we're just going off the instruments and our forecast. Insurance is roughly fifty-five thousand dollars. So, is that one way? And, and the ocean freight you know, it's round trip. But the ocean freight, the ocean freight actually is only about ten thousand of that. It's relatively cheap. Is there much? Uh, are they uh, ecstatic or happy about what's transpired? And does the future look good as far as a continued sponsoring by Airbus? That's a good question. We're not sure. Well, we know they're ecstatic because <laughs> and they more than paid for, you know, if you gave just a penny for a hit, then they more than paid for their donation to us. Um, okay. when, they, when they first joined the team, they gave us enough money to finish the airplane, and they gave us enough money for what we had budgeted for two trips to Argentina. Now, we've been really diligent and, uh, and cheap. So we saved back enough money to go to Argentina one more time. So, so we are looking for more sponsors. So yeah, if anybody here wants to put their name on Perlin after Airbus, uh, come see me. But uh, um, so we got enough for one more campaign. Um, the way they do their budgeting, um, we've actually making a proposal to them for continued sponsorship. And uh, we're optimistic, but... Yeah. Uh, what about our government? Do they give you any money? No. Oh, no, no. no. We have, they don't have any. Yeah, they never have any. No, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you expect any change after, uh, with the change at the top with Tom Anders leaving? Uh, that's, that's part of the uncertainty. Um, the, the way Airbus got connected to us, Dr. Tom Anders, who's their CEO in Europe, he's interested in flying, of course. And, uh, and so... We had a person who made contact with him. He calls up Airbus Americas and says, uh, check these guys out. So myself and a few other people went to <coughs> Washington, D.C. Their American headquarters is at Dulles Airport. And uh, before the meeting, I sat down and kind of looked at who was yeah. on the agenda. And uh, the CEO of Airbus America is Alan T. McGarter. And uh, he used to be an F-4 Thunderbird. I knew him from someplace, so I went to the meeting 15 minutes early. He came in 10 minutes early. We started comparing resumes. It turns out he was my mechanical engineering instructor when I was a freshman at the Air Force Academy. Oh, <laughs> so we spent, so we, we spent several minutes talking about F4s and the Air Force Academy and stuff. So I kind of broke the ice, so, so that helped. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. How is it? Yeah. Well, I was curious. Um, it's a very convoluted route you have to go down to Chile and then over the mountains and down through Argentina and back up again. Is that the cheapest route? Like, I mean, to take the thing to Argentina first and then go through Argentina, is that more costly? Yes. Chile. Yes. Yes. The, the, the problem is the weather around the Cape tends to be so bad oh, that the cost of insurance 
and, and the problems that occur are such everybody recommends don't even try it. So, so, so that's why they ship it to <coughs> And then if you take it through the Panama Canal over to Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires is famous for being customs Hades. Okay. So, so, so the folks in Mendoza, they've been great to us. We've established relationships. That they know what we're doing. I was curious. With yeah. you, I figured it was probably the cheapest, but you know, how come? Yeah. Cheapest and best. Yeah. How did you <laughs> Yeah, you know, in, in the cabin we've got an intercom, we've got a microphone and a mask. We have a VHF radio just like you have in your Cessna. So, so we're talking to the ground that way. Um, we also have a satellite phone in the cockpit, so we can call on a satellite phone. We have an in-reach tracker, which allows us to send text messages, and it's sending our position every two minutes. And the telemetry is sending our position continuously. In fact, we have a website which we call a virtual cockpit. And about two seconds after something happens in the airplane, it shows up on the virtual cockpit. So somebody here in Mojave can be logged on to the website and be watching a flight in real time. And so I appreciate the emails that Jackie sends out. So yeah. if, if you're interested in following, um, the way we've kind of got it hooked up is through our Twitter account. If you wish to follow the Perlin Twitter account, you will get notified when we're flying. And in this virtual cockpit, literally you're going to see it two seconds after it happens. I mean, it's that real time. Um, and there'll be commentary. <laughs> it's coming from me down in El Calafate. But I send it to um, our social media gal, and she gets it on Twitter. And then the Twitter shows up on this virtual cockpit. So you'll see a moving map. You'll see the altitude. You'll see, you know, whether it's uh, plus or minus climb. Okay, you know, whether we're going up or going down, and then you'll get some commentary that's coming from me um, that's going to explain what you might be seeing. For instance, when they pull the spoilers out and, and start to come down, there's a lot of negative. You know, they're they're coming down, and if you're just watching it live online, you literally don't know. Did the wings just come off or what just happened? So I try to get a message on there really soon. Coming home. They've decided to come home. Spoilers are out. And maybe you remember the graphic? Coming home. That, that is a steep curve coming home. And that's what you'll see on the, uh, the virtual cockpit is what we call it. Um, some other of the questions that you've asked, if you go to our YouTube account, Perlin YouTube, there's a, like a 20 second video of them getting out of the glider. And there's no parachutes on them. And you see them get their shoulders out, and then they're, you know, and, just, it, and, it, and it's really tight quarters to, uh, to get in and out of, of the plane. Um, Turbulence on Tow is a video we just posted this week. And it's showing, it was actually this flight right here, which is number 39, one flight after the high flight. But the clouds were gorgeous. Um, and so we, you know, there's a, a, a four-minute video, if, if you care to watch four minutes. Um, there's also a one-minute video, so it's a lot shorter on Facebook than it is on, on our own Perlin uh, YouTube channel. But it'll show you toe, and I mean, that's four minutes. And the Perlin's towing 40 minutes up to 75 minutes through these little bitty eyeballs where they can kind of see the tow plane, but the tow rope is really tough to see. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a job to, to tow. Okay, next yeah. slide. I'm going to give kudos to Kathy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Turned off, so I gotta get a camera. <laughs> well, nice. here we go. All right, thank you. I want you up here because no, I no, yes. no. And, and oh, I want to give you each a shirt. This Both is celebrating okay. Mojave's 140th anniversary last year, so we're 141 now. And if it's too big or too small, take, take it to Sally Kendall, and she will exchange. Okay.
You them. need to be over here underneath where it says Kathy Hanson. There. Okay. <laughs> I love a director. Okay. That's okay. Get on one this side. This side. Because you're blocking me. There we go. I don't want to block the plane. <laughs> oh, look at Phil Deaver. Okay. <laughs> Jim's behind you. Uh, Jim. oh, I don't, oh, I can block Jim, but just not yeah, the plane. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now, okay, now, now this one. Camera one, two, okay. smile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank How you. many playing crazy Saturdays have there Do you know that, guys, we started in January 2009, so we're starting our ninth year. Yeah. So anyway, the kudos to Kathy because, you know, every community needs a spark plug to keep things going. She's been doing this since 2009. There's so many other things she does in Mojave, and between her and Bill,